please welcome Campaign Zero co-founder Brittany Packnett, author of the newly released I'm Judging You, Uja, uh, Lovey Ujai, and New York Daily News senior justice writer Sean King in a conversation with Wesley Lowry of the Washington Post. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for having us. Uh, hopefully, it's been a long but great day of conversation. Hopefully, this one will uh, be able to uh, meet the bar that's been set by everyone else's. Uh, you know, the title of this panel discussion is Black Lives Matter, turning a hashtag into a call for action. And I'm uh, really privileged to be joined here by a panel of, of activists and thinkers who've really been at the forefront of this conversation that has been one of the biggest domestic news storylines of the last two years in the United States of America. and has extended beyond our own borders as we've seen acts of solidarity and protests that have taken place in, in dozens of countries across the world as well. I wanted to start off, you know, since we're, we talk about Black Lives Matter, um, which is both a hashtag and it's an organization, but when we talk about this kind of current protest movement, many people, while there's still some debate about when exactly it started, many people trace that back to Trayvon Martin, 2012, 2013. Um, if that's the beginning of our timeline, we're about three years, three and a half years into uh, what many people consider a social justice movement. I want to start by just taking the temperature, um, and, and whomever wants to start can. What is the current status of, of the movement? We're, we're at a point where we, we know we're seeing a lot of change electorally. We're entering a presidential election. Uh, we're, we're seeing a time where uh, this is something that the media is used to talking about, the country is used to talking about. Have, has anything changed, but also what is the status of, of the current momentum? I mean, I think the status is that we are in a state of maturation, right? We are in a place where we're figuring out how we can take the more nuanced conversation and the more truthful narratives to a place of real change. Um, and we've seen some of that change come about, right? So I'm co-founder of a policy platform called Campaign Zero that we released just over a year ago. Um, it's a 10-point policy platform because we're really saying, how do we ensure that the pressure we're mounting on the streets has an agenda as it moves forth? And how can we make sure that that agenda is useful and accessible by everyone, right? So we use um, this digital platform to make it highly accessible um, and usable for people at the local, state, and federal level. But that's not all there is, right? There's clearly an election coming up. Um, there are not just folks vying for the White House, but there are people that want to represent us at all levels of government. And we have to not only make them care about this issue, but actually commit to what they're going to do and then continue to mount that pressure later. So we're in a space right now where we have to figure out if and how we can really remain organized, remain a collective movement, um, and mature to a place where we are a long-term force to be reckoned with. Well, <clears throat> How the hashtag, people have usually used the word hashtivism. Yes. Okay, okay as a <laughs> it's kind of derogatory way to say people create hashtags and just do nothing but sit on Twitter all day. So I think part of the movement is seeing how it's evolved from people just being like, eh, what's this hashtag that trended on Twitter for a day to now becoming a force to reckon with in terms of that hashtag and just across the way how Twitter has been used in social media, we've forced mainstream media to cover things that they've previously ignored okay. and things that they previously thought was not worth their time. So now it actually created some type of respect and credibility for the work that's being done, done on social media. And then people like Brittany, um, who are creating actual plans that even though they might have started online, you take them offline to really create some, do some good work. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know what? We're not just sitting and playing behind the computer all day. Mm -hmm. We're actually doing some things that matter. Yeah, I, I think your observation that we're three years in is really appropriate because when I look back on the civil rights movement, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott is in 1954 and 1955, but we didn't see the Voting Rights Act pass until 10 years later. We didn't see the Civil Rights Act pass for 10 years later. And so I think Brittany is right that we are in a stage of maturation. Most of us did not know each other three years ago. Uh, we've, in, in a sense, been kind of forced into relationship because of what we're facing and what we're coming up against. The good news in that is um, there's hope because goals take time to develop, uh, take time to actually see come to fruition. And so there's, there's a part of me that's frustrated every single day because the things that anger us are still happening. It's like 
uh, it's like our house is on fire and we're talking about fire codes and, and fire departments. Um, but the solutions are going to take real time to develop and I think we're only just now scratching the surface of thinking through how do we make the solutions that Campaign Zero and other people have presented, how do we make those a reality? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's gonna take six or seven or eight more years for us to see change in a way that's measurable and even visible to the naked eye. And while that, while that bothers me and I wanna see those things happen overnight, um, I think there is uh, there's a precedent for how change happens in America. It's slow in how it unfolds, but it requires us to be immediate in our heart and our concern. Mm -hmm. now, now, Sean, you and I are both people who work kind of within the media, media ecosystem, sure. right? We're, we're reporters, we're writers. Um, it, what's been fascinating to me as someone who's been covering this for two years, now, for two, two and a half years of the three, has been even my own attention span. Um, where, where I don't know as many of the names this year as I might have last year, right? Or, and certainly not as many as I would have in 2014. Sure. How do we, um, and it's not just a question for you, but how, how do we collectively, uh, one, stay on top of this story in a way that is new and fresh and vital, um, but then also in the activism space, how, how do you hold a nation's attention um, because I think very often we live in a world where we, we very quickly believe we know everything there is to know about a certain issue, and then we move on. Um, this has been a conversation we've been having for two straight years now. Uh, without some big, broad, swooping change, how, do you, how does that keep, how, how as an activist do you keep this in the headlines and keep this in a national conversation in a way for seven or eight years to spur the type of change we might have seen at the end of previous movements? I mean, I think part of it is how we continue to creatively engage people, right? I mean. These jerseys are selling out all across the country. And Those are Colin like, Kaepernick jerseys. Colin right, Kaepernick right. jerseys are selling out across the country, and it's something that I'm incredibly happy to, that's right. And it's something that I'm happy to see because it is forcing the conversation into different spaces. There are lots of people who don't know who maybe any of us are, but know him, right, or at least 49ers fans or watch ESPN every night. And so we are forcing a different level of conversation and we're, and we're requiring that conversation to be highly nuanced and truthful, right? No longer is it okay to just simply um, um, dilute a message like, like his to uh, falsify why he's doing what he's doing or why we've been doing what we've been doing, right? I mean, when we entered the streets of Ferguson, we were peaceful and the response that we uh, received treated us like we were enemy combatants, tear gas, pepper spray, mounted rifles. He continues to protest peacefully um, in a way that is completely silent and it still enrages people. And so that is forcing us to reckon with why we are so angry about the thing that has been at our root for so long. Um, and I think that that's how we continue to press it, when we're creative, when we continue to expand the message, and when we force people to deal with these issues. And for me, I'm a humor writer. So my website covers all things pop culture, race, travel. If it's something that I write that is a heavy piece on a Monday, what I do is I give people a palate cleanser on a Tuesday. So I use the humor to have them use, get their defenses down. While your defenses are down, I talk about stages of what happens when there's injustice against black people. But the next day I might talk about something completely different. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to kind of get people to listen when they're open to listening, when they're not so tension filled and they're blocked off. So that's how I use my work and how I use my voice is I make you laugh and then while you're laughing, you just heard about this one really important thing and you're like, whew, and then you laugh again but it's still sitting on your spirit because you can't forget what I just said. So I think it's really important for writers, especially right now, writers and artists, to use their platforms and their power and their privilege to talk about this information. And it's not always about a Twitter chat. You know, It's not always about protesting. It's using your art and using your power to talk and change hearts and minds. Of course. Now, Sean, you, you did a series recently talking about you know, 25 ways to end police violence. It was 20. It was 25? Yeah, 25 solutions. I, did, I didn't want to cut you short. I wasn't <laughs> sure if, if it had kept going or stopped at 25. Um, but but I, and I bring that up, though, in part because it's, it's been interesting to watch you know, for people who write in this space and have been talking in this space uh, as we start to see very clearly perhaps where the conversation should go next, perhaps what some of the solutions are. How, how do you, as someone who has been writing and talking about this 
every single day now for at least since Eric Gardner, right? So yeah. two years, two and a half years. How do you stay motivated to do that? And also, what type of feedback are you getting when you do a series like that very recently? Um, what, what, what are you hearing back from people? Well, I, I interact with a lot of families who are affected by police brutality and racialized violence. And while it may wear on us nationally, for people who experience it, like there was a, um, a man who was killed in Tulsa, Oklahoma, just two days ago. For his family, this isn't old, it's fresh. They are thinking about caskets and what, what they're going to dress him in. They're thinking about life insurance policies. I mean, they, they are wrestling, his children are thinking through what it means to live life without a father. And so when you think about a 13-year-old boy who's killed in Columbus, Ohio this week by police, so while our nation may be kind of worn down to a nub, and while I even may be exhausted by police violence myself, these families who are experiencing it, it is very real, very present, very fresh, and for them, we owe it to them. I, uh, I know I've spoken with Colin Kaepernick throughout these past few weeks, and those, those families are on his mind, and as he he took a knee today. Uh, over 25 different players around the NFL either raised a fist or took a knee today. Uh, college athletes, even peewee football players, are taking knees all over the country because people are saying, I, I can't remain silent. And for these families who are affected by it, I have to push through uh, whatever temptation I may have to fade back into my everyday routine, I have to do something. And um, I've, talked to, I've, I've talked to maybe 15 of the NFL players, and all of them are asking, one, they're all very tied to their cities. Mm -hmm. They're tied to Miami, they're tied to the Bay Area, they're tied to Seattle, and they're all asking, like, what do we do in this city to make a difference? And I think even those of us in the room are all at a point where we're all saying, I've tweeted it, I Facebooked it. How can I plug in in a substantive way and be a part of the solution? I think what's also really relevant there, though, is that you know I hear that complaint all the time that people are tired of hearing about racism, sure. tired of talking sure. about racism. I guarantee you, we are ti more tired of dealing with racism than Word. you are. Tired right, of right, right, right. <laughs> We want to let people off of the hook for the sake of comfort. Well, people being comfortable is how we ended up here, right? right. So that's not going to be the solution moving forward. Right. The other thing we always have to remember is that the resistance to justice, the resistance to equity, is not going to get tired, right? right. Our trolls are in our mentions every, every single day. day. And they are but a small taste of what the resistance looks like to the conversation, that, to even having the conversation, let alone the goals that we talk about in this conversation actually coming to fruition. So is it exhausting? Yes. Is it challenging? Yes. Is it mentally, physically, and emotionally draining? Absolutely. And yet, if not now, when, right? We, we just can't give up. And people ask, you know, what can we physically do? What can we do that's concrete outside of Facebook? Rosa Clemente said something that was like really legit to me. And she said, we don't even need white allies anymore. We need white accomplices. Yeah. And what does that mean is, you see a black person get pulled over, you as a white person stop and watch because your very presence de-escalates the situation. Recently, somebody actually tweeted that she got pulled over by a cop and a white woman stopped. And the cop asked the white woman, hey, what are you doing? She's like, I'm just here to watch because I want to make sure she gets out of here alive. So even if you need just one thing to do, that's one. Number two, you can donate to anti-racism organizations and organizations that are doing the work. So you don't have to be the person standing on the front line. But you want to make sure the person who is standing on the front line has a way to get out of jail when they get arrested for literally standing there. So I really and want, we will. and we will, exactly. So I really want to challenge people to get outside of the idea of they can't do anything. You are one person, but you can do a lot. So these are just two things that you can do. Brittany, one thing I like about your story often is you're someone who has both 
been advocating in boardrooms, in meetings with officialdom, and also someone who's who's sacrificed their body, has been physically um, in the streets, been tear gassed, been arrested. You know, like how do you? What, what is the balance of that, right? This is a conversation we talked about. This conversation taking place in in any number of platforms, right? Whether it being in our online spaces, whether it now being in our sports spaces, in part because of Colin Kaepernick's protest, um, whether it be in our educational spaces, um, and it's a conversation that's started in our streets, in part because that's where Michael Brown's body was, is where Trayvon. Martin's body was. How can you talk a little bit about how you then take that and apply that pressure in those smaller rooms with applying that pressure to power and what that looks like? Yeah, and just a point of clarity, I haven't been arrested yet. I gave her too much credit. I'm sorry. My, my mother's this already is, that like, was me. Right. Was already too worn out about the, my bruised <laughs> lung and the tear gas and all that kind of stuff. I think she'd have a heart attack if I got arrested. But you know, at this point, it could happen. Um, it's two things, right? It's one, remembering that this is not an either or movement, that it has to be a both and, that every single tool we have at our disposal is what we have to use, right? So it's writers, it's reporters, it's artists, it's teachers, it's grandmothers, it's chefs, right? People who feed us when we're out there all night. Like everybody has a role to play, to your point. Um, and remembering that when Dr. King went and met with LBJ, he still went back to the Edmund Pettus Bridge, right? So the meeting is not the win. And if you're in the meeting feeling like, well, I got the seat that I wanted to have, you've already lost, right? The point is you've got to get in there and continue to push, which is my second point, you know, DeRay often calls the act of protest telling the truth in public, right? That's how we think about it. And so if I'm going to tell the truth in the streets, I have to be willing to tell the truth anywhere. The last time I was at the White House, I was sitting in between the president and the governor of Louisiana. And I had just returned from Baton Rouge. I actually had to go and scrounge up some clothes in an hour because the only thing I had packed was protest clothes because I didn't expect to be in that seat. But my responsibility in that seat and in that moment was to tell the truth. And so I sat down next to the governor, and he had a certain version of events that had happened. But I had been out there when DeRay was snatched off the street along with 150 other peaceful protesters. I had been there overnight trying to bail people out of jail. I had been there watching people attempt to make their voices heard and seeing teenagers looking at fully um, armed officers saying, why do you have a rifle and a riot shield when all I have is a poster and a cell phone, right? And I was responsible to not be in too intimidated in that moment to tell the truth and to not be afraid of what the repercussions were going to be. So for me, it's to remember that protest and policy go hand in hand, just like every tool that we have at our disposal, and the, to remember that the truth is important in every space. So before they Emmy music us off, it is Emmy, Emmy night tonight, <laughs> I want to go down the line, um, and since Brittany just, ta just finished, we'll, we'll put Sean on the hot seat, but I want to go down the line in closing, and what is the call to action? I mean, it, in rooms like this very often where, where people have come to hear you speak and speak about your activism and speak about the work that's being done, many people might have that question of what do I do, how do I get involved? What is the call to action um, for those people looking to be get involved in the ongoing movement? I think the, the first request that I have for people is to make a real heart commitment to actually be a part of the solution. And I, I think a lot of the solutions that are going to be required of us with not just these issues, but even beyond that, <coughs> are very local issues. And I can't tell you necessarily what you need to do in your city, in your state, at your school, on your campus, but you have to make a deep, kind of profound commitment in your heart that you're going to be committed to being a part of the solution. And starting there will help you kind of weather the storms of, of what issue is in today or tomorrow or the next day, and will allow you to kind of even weather the storms of presidential elections and, and all the drama that comes with that mm -hmm. and be committed for the long haul. So I mean, the first action step, it may sound esoteric, but it's just about developing a, 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 a commitment that you could demonstrate and prove. Yeah. Uh, for me, we can change policy all day, but if we don't change hearts and minds, that's a problem. And yeah. that starts with you. So at the dinner table, when somebody says something that is, um, prejudiced or racist or homophobic or just any type of hateful say, statement, it's in those moments when it's typically hardest for you to speak up, but it's when it's most necessary. Mm -hmm. So you challenging friends, family members who hold on to these hurtful ideas about human peop humankind and 
whoever does not look or behave like them. So honestly, you can tweet all day, but if it's happening in your home and you're not addressing it, you're part of the problem still. Yeah. And for our final word. I think I would, I would piggyback off of that, right, and extend this to say to not ever let ourselves off the hook, right? We often hear that it's just one bad officer instead of having a truthful conversation about an entirely problematic system, right? It's really easy to say, well, those voters over there are racist and not look at what's happening in maybe your own party, right? What's happening in your own dining ta at your own dining room table or what's happening in the mirror, right? If we're really honest. And so at the end of the day, we have to extend this thing past a presidential election, past a conversation, past a bill, past a an article and continue to never let ourselves off the hook until the entire tree that's rooted in systemic racism and oppression is uprooted. Oh, I was gonna say, how about we have one more round of applause for our panel? Like, and with that, I think we're gonna go. Thank you everyone for having us. Okay. Wait.